we're going to talk about emotion. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced emotion before. Nobody has. That's great. Once, yeah. Then try it again. It's a waste of time. I didn't like it. Uh, so last week, I'm sure you all remember last week. It was so phenomenal. Thanks for, for coming to that class, right? Uh, last week we talked a lot about uh, reproductive behaviors, right? I want to carry some of those themes over to today's lecture as well, okay? So there are certain things that we talked about in that previous lecture that are going to be important today, all right? So some of this is going to be uh, prenatal androgenization. How many of you remember that? Great. So the two of you who raised your hand will do well in the next exam because I'm going to ask you about prenatal androgenization. That's going to be important, okay? So we want to keep that in mind. Uh, the other things we're going to talk about is the role of testosterone and aggressive behavior um, and fear. So that's going to be kind of the big thing that we discuss, all right? So what are the major uh, sort of concepts we're going to cover? We are going to talk about fear. We're going to talk about aggression. Talk about impulse control. Anybody have trouble with impulse control? Yeah, I expected a lot of hands to go up. Thanks for, for not doing that. We're going to talk about communication of emotion. Uh, Regan, have you ever been in a situation where you or someone involved in an interaction with you was not capable of appropriately reading the emotions of the situation? And that causes problems, right? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have ever been in that situation. Quite often, you end up with those like red marks on your face uh, when you misread those emotional uh, situations, right? Sometimes you get slapped. So watch out for that, right? You don't want to get slapped. That's just like word to the wise. Write that down in your book uh, because that's going to be important. I know you're not going to keep the book, and you're going to and you're going to sell it to somebody, and they're going to want to read that. So so there's that. Uh, we're also going to briefly talk about feelings of emotions. So this is going to set up an important concept, and I want to touch on it early. I want to, <coughs> Eloise, I want to use two different words here. Some people use these words interchangeably. Some people talk about their feelings, and they talk about their emotions, right, as the same thing. And, and really, for our purposes, they're two different things, right? So the emotion is going to be one thing. That's going to be more the sort of behavioral output, and we'll kind of define this in just a moment. But your feeling is how you sort of internally experience that emotion, right? So there's going to be two different things, and we're going to use the word emotion when we can. And then later, we'll, we'll talk about feelings. So that's going to be exciting. All right. Heads up. There's no such thing as a neutral emotion. Okay? If you think there is, you're wrong, so just keep that in mind. Uh, now, there are people who don't have uh, emotions, right? There are people with like flat affect. Has anybody heard of that? Um, so that's kind of like people who aren't don't get excited, they don't get depressed, and it's kind of and that's not somebody who's like relaxed and mellow, right? These are actually people who have a psychological issue or a neurological issue where they're not going to be um, expressing or experiencing emotion. Okay, so that's bad. Um, and then there are those people who, who don't always feel the negative consequences of their behaviors, right? And that's kind of a whole different category of things that we'll think about maybe some point in the future. So, an emotion is the positive or negative reaction to a particular situation. Okay, whatever that situation is, you are going to respond to that uh, either positively or negatively, right? How many of you can think of a time, and you don't have to share it because this isn't circle time, uh, for everybody to share their stories, when you've had a positive or a negative emotion, right? Okay. I think uh, this time of year is a time when people have those, especially if you're like a, a college sports fan, right? You have those like positive emotions, um, like like one day, and then two days later you have a negative emotion, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody was following the Marshall basketball team, right? I mean, it was like that that one day where everybody was like super excited, like how did we win that game? And then there was like two days later where uh, we all felt horrible, right? I don't know. So it kind of goes up and down, right? That's the way things go. So there you go. Now what we're really interested in is the physiological changes and the accompanying accompanying behaviors, okay? Because this is, as the title of your book says, Physiology of Behavior, we're interested in those physiological changes and the behaviors, or at a minimum, at least we want to think about the urges to perform those behaviors, right? Okay. 
So, how many of you have ever had an urge to perform a behavior, but you didn't do it? Yeah. How many of you have ever wanted to strangle someone, but you didn't do it? Happens every day to me in this class. Uh, like 40 times over. Nice. There are three of you I like, so 37 times. Uh, yeah, you know who you are. Uh, so, we've had those urges, Alex, to do things. That's fine. You don't do them, please, right? Uh, but for the most part, sometimes you should. Kind of depends on the situation. We'll let you decide. I assume you're a reasonable adult, uh, and you can make those decisions. But the urge is okay. We can think about that as the behavior as well, right? Because there are uh, reasons why we don't perform certain behaviors, and I don't want to think about specific reasons, but there are sort of societal norms that say you can't do those things. Okay, so we have that in place. That's fine. How many of you have ever heard of hormones? Yeah, we spent a long time, Eric, talking about hormones last week, right? Uh, and what I think you should take away from the last chapter, this chapter, and even as we roll into a couple chapters more, we're going to talk about ingestive behavior, right? I think, Travis, what I want to get across to you, not to anybody else, just you specifically, is how important hormones are to your behavior, right? And how much hormones drive your behavior and those physiological changes, and how big of a role hormones play in just your day-to-day -day interactions and, and what you do with your life, right? So that's important. Uh, hormones, the ones we're going to think about are coming from the adrenal medulla. Uh, it's a couple other places. A lot of hormones will increase blood flow to muscles, we know that, and they'll also work to get uh, that glucose available for you. So you're going to take the uh, nutrients that are stored up and you want to liberate those. One of the primary emotions that we can think about and that we can measure, uh, at least responses to, is fear, right? It's really hard for you as an individual uh, to hide your fear responses, okay? Uh, and so those become very measurable things that we can, we can look at and we can study those mechanisms and we can think about that, right? So we'll spend a lot of time talking about fear. In particular, we're going to to talk about the amygdala, okay? And once we get through this chapter, then we'll kind of revisit that learning and memory chapter briefly. Um, that was presented to you, to you by Dr. Maywald. We're gonna come back and hit a couple things there that kind of relate to this and your amygdala and some other interesting processes. So there are three parts of your amygdala that you wanna think about, the lateral nucleus, the central nucleus, and then you also have a basal nucleus. <clears throat> okay. Now, I am not anticipating that you, Jasmine, will know what each individual subdivision of the amygdala is doing, right? And that's not so important to me. What is important to me is for you to think about sort of inputs and outputs of the amygdala and how it's connected to other brain regions, right? So this is kind of important. So, this is your amygdala. By the way, amygdala is uh, from the Latin word for almond. I don't know if any of you love almonds. Anybody an almond fan in particular? Anybody hate almonds? Yeah, you might have a nut allergy too, right? So that could, that could bias you against almonds. Nobody's in that group, nobody's got a nut allergy. That's good, because I coated all of your seats with peanuts before you came in here. No, no, nobody's breaking out in hives, we're okay. Um, there you go. So, uh, we have the central nucleus, the basal nucleus here, and then the uh, lateral nucleus as well. The lateral nucleus is the one that's going to receive these inputs from your cortex, your thalamus, and your hippocampus, okay? Uh, cortex, we know, is doing a lot of high order planning, has some memory uh, structures there as well. Hippocampus is also going to be involved in accessing memory, so that's going to be important. And then your thalamus, that's going to be processing sensory information, right? So Justin, we need to, to have that sensory information coming to our amygdala, and then we need to be comparing that to our memories, for memory banks, so we can decide, is this something that should cause me fear, or is this something that is benign and safe, right? So we need to constantly be comparing that. Uh, to the memory stores that we have. We are going to have to have outputs 
from uh, these areas as well. We will send some things to your prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is going to be important here in a few moments when we talk about that impulse control. We're going to talk about the role and the connections between the amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. We're going to give you some fun stories about Phineas Gage. For those of you that are familiar with Phineas Gage, it's an interesting story. I'm going to hopefully be able to add a couple details to that story for you, right? Um, you know, a couple uh, don't try this at home kind of things. Uh, you know, never, never, uh, you know, look down the barrel of a gun or look down a hole that's full of dynamite, right? You can learn that, yeah, you can learn that the hard way. Um, and Phineas Gage did. I'm not so certain it really helped him later because part of his brain was missing. So we'll see if that had any effects in his life. We also have outputs to other places. Uh, we have output to the striatum, some other things going out to the thalamus, which then go up to your prefrontal cortex as well. Importantly, um, if you dial back two slides and you see that word hormones, importantly, there is an output to the hypothalamus from your amygdala as well, right? And your hypothalamus is sort of the start of that cascade of hormone release, right? So you've got your hypothalamus telling your pituitary gland to release some hormones that will tell other parts of your body to release hormones as well, right? And so you kind of get that, get that started there in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls some other things, in particular your autonomic nervous system, okay? Which controls things like heart rate, uh, vasodilation, blood flow to certain parts of your body, right? And so your, your autonomic nervous system can get kicked in here as well. Here are uh, just a full list of the outputs of the central amygdala, central nucleus. I don't expect you to memorize all of these, okay? Uh, but keep in mind some of those major outputs, right? And think about the role that those outputs play in the, uh, the behaviors associated with those emotions. I mean, here's one in particular that goes to the, uh, <coughs> You don't have to know the name of it, don't worry about it. But this uh, particular nucleus is involved in the startle response. How many of you have ever been startled? It happens, right? <laughs> Trying to startle us, Eric? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, we appreciate that. Good demonstration. Uh, so uh, there's your startle response. Uh, we have some areas that are involved in um, vigilance, uh, behavioral arousal, Increasing respiration, this is important. How many of you have ever run from someone? Yeah, Regan, you gotta breathe faster. All right, it helps. Uh, how many of you have ever, how many of you are, anybody on the track team? Next time you run, do you, do you still run? You, you, you're gonna like, go run five miles today, right? That's what I want you to do. Hold your breath the whole time and see what happens. Uh, just let me know how far you make it before you fall down. Does anybody ever do that? Like, see how far you can run without breathing? Why doesn't anybody do these fun things? <laughs> I, think, I think this is exciting, right? No, nobody's going to do that. <laughs> uh, you should try it, though. So, and we have to increase, uh, increase uh, respiration. Also, here's a little uh, preview for later. Uh, we have to control facial expressions uh, of fear, right? That's important, not for you. Do you know what a facial expression does for you? Nothing, Abby. Right? You can't see your face. Can you see your face right now? No. So it doesn't matter what your facial expression is to you, but it matters to me. Okay, and that's what's going to be important. Uh, letting other people know how your, what your emotional state is and where that emotional state is, is directed. It's going to be very important to us. Okay. All right. So, we're still going to talk about fear a little bit. I'd like to talk about something called the conditioned emotional response. And you may have covered this a little bit in the, uh, that learning and memory chapter, so there's going to be some overlap here. But we're going to talk about classical conditioning, right? And so classical, classical conditioning is basically uh, sort of Pavlov's dogs, right? You guys remember Pavlov's dogs? They'll always tell you like it started out with them ringing a bell and then the dog salivated. That's a little bit of revisionist history. 
Um, and that's trying to make Pavlov look like he's a little more important than he actually was. Uh, Pavlov had no interest initially in studying mechanisms of learning. He was actually interested in studying dog salivary glands, right? Uh, and so he was really only interested in dog uh, saliva. Everybody loves dog spit, right? Um, so if you've got nothing else to do, you should study dog spit. So he was studying dog salivary glands, and he noticed that the dogs started salivating while they were clinking around the metal bowls trying to get their food. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, just when the food arrived, it was before the food, while they were making, one of his technicians was making a lot of noise um, trying to feed the dogs. And he started noticing they started salivating. And then he thought, well, hey, you know, not really making the old dog spit avenue. Let me try some learning mechanisms and see what we can we can do there, right, Travis? And so he, he sort of shifted the focus of his research. And I, I think we're probably all better off for it, uh, and so was Pavlov. So they actually have, like, universities named after Pavlov in Russia. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool, right? I actually used to work with a guy who went to, like, Pavlov State University. I don't know if that's what it's called. Uh, but that's where, where he did some of his training. Uh, so we have something called the classical or the classically conditioned fear response. Basically, it goes like this. Uh, you've got a mouse or a rat. It doesn't really matter. You can do it to a person. Uh, so it's kind of fun. Anybody have a roommate they don't really like? Yeah. Emily's like, yeah. I, was like, I saw that face. You communicated that emotion to me quite easily. Thank you. Uh, so if you have uh, a roommate or a rat, whatever, it doesn't matter. Sometimes they're the same. What you can do is, uh, if you have a rat in a cage and you want to scare that rat, one way that they used to do this was like they would ring a bell and then they would shock the rat, right? That's kind of the standard way of doing this. Michaela, okay, you seem to get too happy about that. Because I don't know who your roommate is, but you're thinking about shocking your roommate, aren't you? Yeah, I, that's really funny. I, I might try that. Yeah, it's worth it. It really is. Um, so you can do this. After a while, bell, shock, bell, shock, bell, shock, you keep doing this to the rat. Then, you know, you just play the bell and guess what the rat does? Oh, I'm going to get shocked. It jumps, right? Just like you think it's going to get shocked. How many of you have an older brother? Anybody have an older brother? Yeah, yeah. How many of you I'm going to ask you about this, Matt, because I can tell by the look on your face this happens. Uh, your older brother ever punch you in the ribs? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right? Constantly, right? That's what older brothers do. I've got a younger brother, I know. Right? Um, and so every time you see your brother, you do one of these. Right? Because you know it's coming. And I'm just going to go ahead and dodge for it. Get ready, because he's going to punch me. That's a classically conditioned emotional response. Right? Because you, you know something's coming. Your brother's the stimulus, the punch. You know, there you go. That's the negative thing. You know it's going to happen. Now, at a certain point, you're going to imagine your brother's going to get mature enough to stop that. Right? It may be another couple of decades. Hang in there. It'll happen. No? Eric's like, no, it doesn't happen. Are you the older or the younger? Sorry. You're bigger now. Yeah. See, that's the, my younger brother is, is actually a good bit larger than I am. Um, thankfully, he's slower. So uh, I can still outrun him. <clears throat> I used to call him my little brother, but he's like 6'2", 260, so I'm like, I have that work anymore. Um, I still have more hair than he does. He's like 10 years younger than I am, and his hair is a lot thinner than mine, so I'm winning that one. Uh, so I, I take it easy on him these days, um, which that's an important one. Uh, you don't want to lose your hair before your younger brother. So, so work on that. Did you give him a lot of nookies when he was younger or something? I did not, actually. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I wish I had now, because I could have accelerated that process. <clears throat> we, could have, we could have seen what would happen. Uh, his hair still has color to it, though, so he's, he's winning that front, but, but I've got more of it, so we're okay. At a certain point, man, we're going to imagine that your brother's going to stop punching you, <clears throat> okay? And, and then after like a decade of him not punching you, you may stop flinching when you see him. That's called an extinction process, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, okay? So, ring a bell, shock a rat, ring a bell, shock a rat, not a big deal. At a certain point, you're going to ring that bell. You're not going to shock the rat, but he's still going to have that fear response. How many of you have ever, uh, we're sort of out of the time frame when this is going to happen as much. How many of you have, um, this happens with doorknobs a lot, right? How many of you have a chair at home and your doorknob shocks you when you touch it, right? So Matt, what do you do? You kind of, you're ready for it, right? Yeah, you know, right? It's going to happen. Okay. 
At a certain point, it might stop. Now the weather's a little nicer. You're not wearing these like big parkas all the time. You stop building up so much static electricity, and you can just spring and summer. You can grab that knob, and you're out the door. Okay, so that's that extinction process. <clears throat> The amygdala is going to be involved in this uh, human emotional process, same as in a rat. Okay. Same basic mechanisms, not a big deal. How do we know this? Uh, we know it because if you lesion the amygdala, you're going to have a decrease in emotional responses. Okay? Not a big deal. Uh, now, most people aren't signing up for amygdala lesions. Okay? I mean, there's not a long line of people going, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd really like to not be able to feel fear anymore, you can't just like cut that part of my brain out. Uh, doesn't really seem like a great thing to do. Fear is highly valuable, right? And fear is really valuable because it prevents you from doing stupid things, okay? It really does. Um, so fear works well to keep you protected and uh, it, it's got a great survival mechanism, right Colin? So if you think about this, uh, you know, think about a, a rat. What should a rat be afraid of? A lot of things, right? So you should not you know, like cats, for example. Rats shouldn't go up and start slapping cats in the face because they'll be eaten. So that fear mechanism plays a big role there and keeps the, uh, keeps the rat alive. What are things you shouldn't slap in the face? Uh, a bear, for example, right? I don't know if anybody's ever slapped a bear in the face. Uh, they didn't make it to class today. That's what happened to them. So there you go. I wonder how that works with mongoose or mongoose. And cobras. Mongoose? Yeah, I don't know. You ever wonder about that if it's yeah. mongoose or mongooses? I assume geese. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with mongoose. I like that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. They're just like, I don't give a damn. Yeah, the mongoose is a wily little animal, right? Uh, so you gotta, and, <clears throat> and some, some species actually have um, immunity to certain venoms, so it's not as much of a threat as it is to like either of us, right? All right, so uh, also, if you teach an animal that conditioned response, that conditioned uh, fear response, or that conditioned emotional response, and you lesion their amygdala uh, before or afterward, they're actually not going to be able to, uh, to have that response. So this rat, if we were to go in and destroy this rat's amygdala, then it's actually not going to have that fear response anymore, okay? The other thing is, is, is really kind of interesting. Uh, lesions of the amygdala actually interfere with the, uh, the emotions of memory, for example, okay? And then here in a moment we're going to talk medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, that's that extinction process. The, the medial prefrontal cortex is going to be important there. So there are a number of folks who have looked at this sort of in humans, right? And what they have seen is the same stuff we see in rats. There was actually a, an interesting study a number of years ago with uh, sort of, it was kind of a, a, an interesting confluence of things that allowed this to happen. This was in Japan, there was an earthquake in Japan. There happened to be a number of individuals who had had uh, damage to their amygdala, right, for one reason or another. Sometimes you'll, you'll have your amygdala removed if you have temporal lobe epilepsy, right? They'll take out the amygdala at the same time um, to, to prevent you from developing seizures. There are also folks who uh, have Alzheimer's disease I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alzheimer's, we'll talk about that. It's a, it's a slow degenerative process. Well, I say slow because it takes a few years, but it's still fairly rapid uh, in some cases. But it's a degenerative process. It can start in different locations. If it starts in the amygdala, you're actually going to selectively lose like emotional memories before you lose some of your other memories. And if you compare folks who have the same amount of total degeneration that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and if you look at individuals who their amygdalas have been selectively uh, targeted by that uh, disease compared to folks who have a broader sort of targeting, you, you'll actually see that those folks have a, a decrease in um, emotional memory. But this study in Japan, they uh, interviewed folks who had lived through this earthquake. Uh, you know, your average, I don't know, has anybody ever lived through an earthquake? Yeah, so Abby, if you were to describe that, you don't have to. So I don't want to bring up, because it could be an emotional experience, right? But if you're in a severe earthquake, you're going to include you were scared, you were frightened, you were probably cowering under a desk or a table. Hopefully that's a safe place to go, right? Those are probably typical descriptions of, of your experience. Individuals who are missing their amygdalas for one reason or another 
in this study uh, from Japan, their responses were kind of like, yeah, it was Tuesday, I had a turkey sandwich, uh, building started shaking, I don't know, TV went out. Uh, there's not really any emotional content in there, right? Because they don't have an amygdala to feel uh, or to experience the, the fear emotion, right? They can still remember the things that happened, but it's not going to have that emotional content. Okay? <clears throat> so that's kind of cool, right? There you go. In this particular study, uh, this was involving folks who actually were shocked had this kind of like thing they would get shocked on the wrist when they were uh, presented with a square, not a big deal. Over time, they continued to uh, present that square to these individuals and they weren't shocked. And what was really interesting is your amygdala is no longer, uh, you know, going to be activated by that over some time because you're not actually, you know, experiencing a negative response or a negative uh, experience. What you do see is your medial prefrontal cortex becomes much more active during this, what we call the extinction phase, okay? This is not a process of forgetting. This is not a process of unlearning, okay? The extinction process is simply you realizing that that stimulus, whatever it is, okay, whether it's your brother, the doorknob, the bell, the squares, is no longer a good predictor of a negative experience, okay? And so you're going to no longer be valuing that stimulus as a predictor of a negative experience. And this is great. How many of you live in an environment uh, that changes? Okay, you all do, so you can all raise your hands. It changes, right? Things change all the time, constantly. Okay. How many of you have ever lived in a different home than the one you live in now? Yeah, I'm going to assume like almost all of you, right? I'm going to assume very few of you live in the exact same home you have for the last 20, give or take, years, right? That's not a common experience, okay? You, you currently live somewhere where you didn't live in the past. So your environment changed, right? How many of you have, you know, how many of you have an outlet that doesn't work just right? You sort of got to, you know, plug it in and run, right? So you don't get shocked, but you need to use that outlet because... I don't know, you don't want to move your dresser to open up the other outlet. Does anybody do that? Yeah, right where you're going to have is all the time, right? You've got, you got that one outlet that, I don't know, like half the outlets in my apartment, like the plug only goes in like, let's say, 80% of the way, and I'm like always afraid that it's going to get me, so I have to like really jam it in there to make sure it, it fits. I don't, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me, like, like how you can get two tight outlets. I, I don't know, like if that's like a variety of outlet that you get, and it's a little frightening. It's a new building too. Which is, I was like, where do you live? I don't want to live there. Yeah, no, no, it's it's not. It's a it's a nice apartment, I guess. But see. the outlets are a little tricky. So there you go. Uh, and some of them are in there a little crooked. I don't know. I don't know who the contractor was, but he didn't do a great job. Um, and I watched them build like the rest of the building too, so I know they didn't do a great job. Uh, that's how I know it's a new building because I was like the first person to move in. Uh, but over time, things change, right? Over time, certain uh, stimuli are no longer good predictors of a negative experience. And so you no longer need to hang on to that and no longer need to keep that sort of uh, salient, right? And so you need to change that. Something else may become a good predictor. In this example, the bell was a great predictor of being shocked. Okay? Over time, we keep playing that bell, no shock, bell, no shock. Eventually, the rat's going to go, hmm, all right, good to go. But what you can do is maybe next time you want to make it a light. Elizabeth, maybe I'm going to flash a blue light, right? And then I'm going to shock the rat. And then that blue light becomes a good predictor, and the rat will go, blue light, I'm going to get scared of that. Okay. Now, we've talked about your prefrontal cortex, in particular, we want to talk about the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the VMPFC. Okay? Ventral means on the bottom, prefrontal is in the front, medial is in the middle, so it's kind of on the bottom in the middle, front of your brain. Okay? This plays a major role in the complex analysis of social situations. How many of you have ever been in a social situation? 
You're in one right now. Okay. Other people around, there are certain ways that you should behave in this classroom, right? And you know those, because most of you follow those rules. Some of you don't. I, I write your names down every week and deduct 20% from your total grade. So watch out for that. But Betsy, if you were going to go like two and a half buildings over that way to the Cam Henderson Center, there's a different set of rules, right? You can do different things there than you can do here. Okay? You can scream, you can yell, that's acceptable. You can spill popcorn on the person in front of you if there was a really only if there was a really exciting play and you had to jump up quickly, right, Eric? Otherwise you've got to keep the popcorn in your bag. But if there's something exciting you can you can do that. Can't do that in here. Olivia, I don't want you throwing popcorn on anybody. Okay? Uh, can't happen. No screaming. I, I mean there are certain times you could scream, I guess, in this class, but we're not gonna do you have to analyze that complex social situation, and your ventromedial prefrontal cortex is doing that. This is the part of the brain that um, Phineas Gage sort of blasted out, right? And so Phineas Gage was this railroad worker uh, in the 1800s. There's still a similar process but that happens, but you don't really have to do it by hand anymore. Uh, so if you're going to blast out a big piece of land, how you do this is you drill a series of holes and you put a stick of dynamite down in there. And if anybody's ever tried to blow up the side of a mountain, you know that you want the dynamite all the way in the bottom of that hole. That's just how it works best, okay? So, Alyssa, how we might get that dynamite down in there is using a thing called a tamping rod, right? Which is a, basically like a <coughs> long stick of metal, okay? And it's kind of tapered, so one end it's kind of small, and the other end it's kind of bigger. Uh, this particular one, I think, had like a, a diameter of about two inches, which is a pretty size. And so Phineas Gage he got this great job of tamping down the dynamite. Sounds like a great job, right? No, no, not at all. Occasionally that dynamite will accidentally explode. That's the thing dynamite does, right? So I don't know if any of you are like sitting on some dynamite at home. Watch out, it could accidentally explode. Happens all the time, okay? Especially when you're like beating on it, right? And so if you're like beating on this dynamite, and then Phineas Gage, I think he had poor technique uh, because he must have been like leaning over the top of that hole like beating this metal rocket down in there and the dynamite explodes, shoots the tamping rod up through the bottom of his head, right? Comes out the top and it lands like 30 feet away from him. He really shot a missile through his head. That's pretty impressive. What's more impressive is the guy lived for an extended period of time afterward, okay? He did weird things though. His, uh, his, his behavior sort of completely changed, his personality changed. He did things that were not socially acceptable in particular situations. He was unable to realize he was in a classroom and not at a basketball game. So in the middle of a basketball game, he may have raised his hand to ask a question of the head coach uh, to explain you know, why he made a substitution for a particular player. Uh, and when he was in a classroom, he may have jumped up and down and screamed foul, uh, you know, if he didn't like something that somebody said. Okay? So he, he had things sort of screwed up. I would not recommend doing that, like blasting a giant metal rod through your head. Okay? I don't think it's an experiment we can recreate. However, uh, highly valuable to the entire, like sort of like, here's how your brain works community. Phineas Gage may have been one of the most important people in the history of brain science uh, by having this freak accident and living through it. So there you go. That's kind of a fun story, right? No? Nobody? I know, it's not as fun as like the sheep in trench coats, but I think blasting a metal rod through your head is still pretty cool. Uh, you know, in the grand scheme of like things you could hear about in class. All right, so we've talked to this extinction process a bit, right? Um, so not a big deal. There's some context-dependent issues here. We're not going to really get into that. But we'll go through this extinction process again. This rat has learned that the bell is no longer a good predictor of the electrical shock, so it does not need to be afraid anymore. Okay, so it can analyze that, um, you know, that situation. During this process, that medial prefrontal cortex is going to be very active. 
during this extinction process, okay? The medial prefrontal cortex is involved in impulse control. It's controlling the impulse of this ramp to go, bell, shock is coming. Okay, Robin, so it's controlling that impulse. Then the rat's gonna go, bell, I'm good. No worries, controlling that impulse. By the way, here's your ventral medial prefrontal cortex. There's a tamping rod going through it. If you're Phineas Gage, do you wanna see that again? Right like that. Uh, that's how that happened. Came right out the top of his head. I don't know. So, but this part of his brain was sort of completely gone. Which is amazing that it was only that part of his brain and not the rest of it. Always gives me a headache thinking about this. I'm gonna like check and make sure the top of my head's still on. All right, let's see. We talked about the amygdala gets activated when there's a fear-related behavior. Not a big deal. We've got that conditioned emotional response. We talked about the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is involved in that extinction of that conditioned emotional response, right? It's involved in the process of learning to devalue that particular stimulus, right? That it's no longer going to be predictive of a negative experience, and I can uh, go on about my business, okay? Impulse control. Hey, how many of you love snakes? Yeah, I've got a couple in my office I'm gonna bring in later for a demonstration. That's, that's a true story. I had a student bring a snake to class one time. Yeah. Heard like aquarium shattered that morning. It was like exam day. It was a summer class I was teaching. <coughs> she brought in this snake. I mean, what are you going to do? At least they don't make noise and, and they don't defecate. Uh, but like once a month. You only feed them once a month. If something goes in once a month, something comes out once a month. Right? That's how that process works. And so snakes are really awesome that way. How many of you have a cat? Yeah, stuff goes in that thing and comes out all the time, right? Okay, so like hair falls off of it, scratch stuff. You have a snake, that's clean. Nothing to worry about. Like once every few months, you get a little bit of skin to come off, you toss it. It's not a big deal. Once a week, you toss an animal in there, it eats it. Once a week, a turd comes out. End of story. You want a low maintenance pet, always go for a snake. Lizards, on the other hand, lots of work, but snakes are not. So there you go. Anybody ever had a pet snake? Yeah, I had one for a while. They're nice. They are clean, they don't make noise, easy to feed, no prep on the food. That cat, you gotta take its food out of the can, right? Take some time, put it in a bowl, nothing. Nothing with a snake. Toss and run. You should get them out and handle them once in a while, though, right? So let's, they'll, they'll try to eat you in your sleep. All right, so we've already talked about the amygdala. Hey, how many of you were born with an amygdala? I, I'm going to assume all of you were, okay? Uh, the amygdala is awesome because it's really great at provoking anger and violent emotional reactions. And those are important sometimes, right? How many times have you ever been in a situation where uh, a violent emotional reaction, I'm not saying violence necessarily, Alex, but a violent emotional reaction or anger was an appropriate response? That happens, right? That's good for survival. This happens. When you are in line at Starbucks and somebody cuts in front of you, anger and violence are appropriate, right? Probably, prob probably not. Let's think about something more serious. Uh, what if someone tries to steal your car while you're in it? Like anger and violence are probably appropriate then, right, Eric? Whatever you do at that point, if someone tries to steal your car, whatever response you have to that is fine. We're not going to get upset, right? Self-defense, you're okay. So it's important for that. Uh, this matures very early in development, okay? The problem with this is, how many of you have ever been shopping and there's been a child there and you thought, geez, this is horrible, um, because there's a child there while you're trying to shop? Sometimes it's your own child. Uh, you're like, why did I bring this kid? Uh, how many of you have ever seen a kid or have been that kid who threw a fit because their mom did not let them come home with, and you can fill in the blank here with like, you know, your favorite Power Ranger, 
or candy bar, or I don't know, what are the other things kids like? I don't know. That's what I'm going to assume kids like. Uh, and they throw a fit, right? You ever seen those kids that do this? And they're just in the floor wailing because they were not able to get a Hershey's bar, right? And the reason for that is they honestly believe, like, if I don't get that Hershey's bar, I'm going to die, right? Because that kid has to have that. They have just an amygdala. They don't have a prefrontal cortex. You really don't get that prefrontal cortex until, like, late childhood into early adulthood. Um, into like senior citizen age for some people, right? So, uh, just kidding. Um, you don't get your prefrontal cortex really fully developed until you get a good bit earlier, okay? So you don't understand what are the negative consequences of my actions, okay? If you're three or four or 15, because uh, we, we've seen that too, uh, and you throw an actual tantrum, that's because you, you, your brain's not developed, right? So this is, Abby, this is why I don't get mad at, at people, right? Because I just assume people who are doing stupid things, their brain's not developed. Uh, and so I don't get angry at a lot of people because of that. This happens a lot. How many of you have ever seen someone get upset at an NFL player because he said something stupid? Yeah, you can't get mad at people with brain damage. That, that's just not fair. Uh, and all of, all of, Matt, all of those guys have brain damage. It's a true story, right? I'm, I'm not telling you anything new. They all have brain damage. And I'm not going to defend or condone anybody. But when Cam Newton wears whatever he wears, it's because he has brain damage. And that, that's a known fact. It's not any other reason. I can't get mad at him for that. Yeah, his hats look stupid. Move on. He's got brain damage. That's a, that's a true story. And you guys should really cut some people some slack. I'm not saying that like it makes anything he says or does correct, because it doesn't. It just he has brain damage and that's why he does those things. Happens all the time, right? I don't worry about it. I spend my time on other things. Now, this prefrontal cortex, it's gonna suppress that ridiculous, what we think is ridiculous behavior, but it's really not if you look at it as like, I have to have this for survival, right? So that kind of like violent tantrums are really explainable in that sense uh, because it's going to help you see those negative consequences, right? You're going to start thinking about, you know what, if I really pitch a fit over this candy bar, uh, my mom's probably going to ground me and for the next, I don't know, however long of my life, I'm not going to be able to leave my house. And that sounds like a bad thing, okay? So you can kind of like think ahead and plan a little bit and suppress those bad behaviors. You don't have a prefrontal cortex. You're just going to do whatever, right? Okay. So it happens. Anybody a Cam Newton fan? I didn't mean to like really trash on Cam Newton there. But 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 his behavior is particularly weird. Um, and and if you look at like the last four years, he's been sacked more than any other quarterback, plus any other quarterback, right? I mean, he's been hit more than about anybody. I, I think his offensive line is like the worst in the league. Or he's, like, it's this positive feedback loop too, right? Like after you get hit once and then you think like, ah, geez, my prefrontal cortex isn't working, you start making more bad decisions. And I know he's like bigger than everybody else and he thinks he can run over top of people, which he can, uh, but that just means you're gonna wear bad hats later. It's a trade-off. Keep that in mind. Nobody thought they were gonna get that explanation today, right? Like, like how many of you thought like I was gonna use Cam Newton to describe the effects of a prefrontal cortex? It works. All right, uh, so what about aggression? We'll talk a little bit about aggressive behavior because it relates to some of this. Um, it's a species typical behavior, so every species is going to exhibit aggression in a different way. Regan, are you the only person in my aggression class in here? Not in that class. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you should have registered for it, it was a good class. Is there anybody in my aggression class or somebody? Are you it? Yeah. All right. So there you go. You can sleep for the next five minutes. I'll wake you up. Uh, so there are different kinds of aggressive behaviors. You're in my sensation and perception class. Yeah, I remember that now. I just, I, I, I hoped there was a day between when I had to see you, but it's not. It's like two days in a row. And, and I, I, I know. <laughs> I'll watch out for that next time I make my schedule. 
teach you. Uh, so there are different kinds of aggressive behaviors. There are threat behaviors, uh, defensive behaviors, submissive behaviors. You don't always think about that. And then uh, like predatory behaviors. This is for like animals trying to eat other animals. So that's the kind of predation we're thinking about there. Uh, I just want to clarify that. Um, aggressive behaviors are important. Uh, typically, it's related to uh, reproduction, uh, mates. Often, it's also related to uh, resource, uh, food, or shelter, which again can go back to your access to mates, right? Um, you don't have to answer this, but uh, you know, if like all else is equal, would you rather mate with someone that has a home and food, or someone that doesn't have a home or food, right? probably going to go with the person that actually has a place to live and like has stuff in their refrigerator for you to eat either before or afterward, right? That's, just, that's, that's pretty well across the board, right? I mean, that, that's, so, so there you go. Um, get a house and keep your fridge stocked. Those are this is good advice. All right, um, so for defense, uh, defensive behavior, Again, we're going to involve that amygdala, right? Because you should be afraid, like if there's something coming to attack you, right? So we're going to activate uh, fear. Okay, so we're going to activate that nucleus. We're going to have uh, some of that information that's going to go to the hypothalamus and then to a couple areas in what we call the periaqueductal gray. Okay? And these will, uh, there are two regions there. There's a dorsal and a ventral. You don't have to know which is which. One part is going to activate defensive behaviors and the other is going to activate predatory behaviors. Uh, for like you know, hunting food or or something or some other resource. Not a big deal. Hey, how many of you love serotonin? Mr. Dory, you've never heard me talk about serotonin, have you? No. No. I missed it. Yeah, you missed that. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I, I'm teaching a class on aggression this semester. For those of you that didn't catch on to that, um, we probably how many weeks have we been in that class? Ten. So there's like five weeks left. I have probably spent 12 of those weeks talking about serotonin. So, it's been a pretty popular topic. Uh, serotonin is actually kind of cool. If you activate your serotonin uh, system, you're actually going to inhibit aggressive behavior. Okay. How many of you remember that time we talked about sleep? Yeah, and we said, Michaela, we said like serotonin is involved in sleeping, right? Have you ever slept aggressively? It's kind of hard to do, right? Kind of hard to go like, like jump in and punch your pillow and then like fall asleep all of a sudden. Um, there aren't a lot of folks who can pull that one off. So it's really hard to sleep aggressively. So your serotonin levels are going to be high when you go to sleep. They're also going to be high when you're not aggressive. Okay. So there's that kind of nice correlation. If you destroy uh, the serotonergic axons, it's actually going to facilitate aggressive attacks. Right? So if you go in and you, you get rid of these or, or destroy these, uh, the serotonergic pathway, that animal is going to get aggressive. Jared, we're typically not doing this in people. We're not thinking, like, how can I make you more aggressive? Let me cut open your head and like, cut some serotonin out. Uh, we're doing this typically in rats, for example. <clears throat> we also give people uh, serotonin agonists, though, if they're irritable or aggressive. right? So you can give folks uh, like an SSRI. That's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's going to increase the amount of serotonin that's available for you. So often, um, folks who come in with severe irritability or aggressiveness, uh, they'll be prescribed an SSRI to help with that. That's pretty good, right? Have you ever thought about this? Like, how many of you watch MMA fighting? Anybody into that? Yeah, all right, Ray, you got your hand up there. You know what you should do? You should become an MMA coach. I don't know if you are one of these already. You should think about it. And then what you should do is you should like work for your opponent, like your, your team's opponent, and like slip a little bit of serotonin into their water bottles before the matches. And then they'll become less aggressive during the fight, and the other guy will win. And you could really bet a lot of money on the other guy to win to really clean up. I know that's like a long, involved process, but I think you could make some money at that. No, you're not going to try. No, <clears throat> it would work. I promise you. No, not gonna do it. All right. Well, if you do, let me know. But don't, don't, don't like cite me when you're 
like under investigation by the FBI or something. Tell them it was your own idea. <clears throat> hey, how many of you love monkeys? Nobody? Yeah, they'll, they'll throw like feces at you and give you diseases. You gotta watch out. No, no, true story. Um, this is a very complicated graph. Um, and it might be one of the most confusing graphs in this entire class. Um, and I have taught this class a number of times, and every time I've thought about what is the best way for me to describe the way this graph works so that you can follow the lines and figure out what's happening. And I decided, like, nah, I, I know, right? And, and you actually know what this tells you because I told you about this. Um, and it's still confusing, right? Here's the story. There were a bunch of monkeys. And there were some folks who started studying those monkeys. And they said, hey, we would love to know if these monkeys are aggressive, if they have extra risk-taking behaviors, and how that relates to their serotonin levels. So here's sort of a not true story. They measured serotonin levels. As one of you know, you can't measure serotonin levels directly. You've got to measure some metabolite. But they did that. That's the 5-H-I-A-A. It's a metabolite of serotonin. Don't worry about that. They're going to measure serotonin levels in these monkeys over time, and they're going to figure out uh, which ones of them are alive and which ones are dead. And here's the basic short story. At the end of this study period, which lasted for a little while, uh, the monkeys with the highest levels of serotonin were more likely to still be alive. The monkeys with the lowest serotonin levels were less likely to be alive. Right? And so if you think about this, how many of you know someone who says, You've heard somebody say this, yeah, I can jump that, right? And they didn't. And you knew they shouldn't jump it because it was a bad idea. I didn't really know why you are going to make that. That person who did the jump probably had low serotonin levels compared to you who were like, you know what, I think that's a bad idea, right? Because you're going to be doing less risk-taking behavior with higher serotonin levels. The lower serotonin, you're going to be more prone to risk-taking behaviors. The more risk-taking behaviors that you perform, uh, the more likely you are to die or be injured. Okay? That's a true story, right? Now, there's a little bit of a trade-off here. And that trade-off is, so you might think, well, wow, shouldn't everybody have really high serotonin levels? Why do we even have people with lower serotonin levels, right? The problem is occasionally you have to take a risk, right? Because if you don't take a risk, then things are stagnant, you don't make any improvements, and uh, some other group of people come in and just kill you. And that happens. So occasionally you have to be able to take risks. So there needs to be a certain percentage of the population uh, that has lower serotonin levels so we can constantly keep society sort of moving forward and taking risks and, and, and ready for that. If we all had really high serotonin levels, we would just be like, oh yeah, man, you can have that. Uh, and just give away our resources and then we'd all die. Right? But you have to be able to defend your resources on some level. Does that work? So we need this good mix of uh, high and low serotonin level folks in society. Makes sense, right? All right. Hey, who wants to talk about hormones again? Hormones play a role in controlling aggressive behavior. Uh, in males, for example, we'll talk about males. This is mostly in rodents. Uh, androgen secretion, which again we're talking about testosterone. Uh, we know that's going to happen in the uh, uterus and then it's going to uh, have a big spike in a puberty. We also know that in rodents, what we call intermale aggression, so it's two males just fighting each other sort of randomly, uh, has a considerable increase in puberty. Okay? And we see this in humans too, right? Uh, male aggressiveness has, a, has an increase in puberty um, as well. That's not surprising, right? Females, the story's a little different. Uh, and largely that's because females tend to be less aggressive than males. And if I'm really selling you this story that testosterone is one of the primary hormonal motivators and controllers of aggression, it would make sense that females would be less aggressive because on average females are going to have considerably, considerably lower levels of testosterone. Right? And so you're going to have less of that going. However, it does appear that aggression does facil or is facilitated by testosterone in females. So females with higher levels of testosterone are more aggressive uh, than females that um, don't have 
as much testosterone. Jasmine, I love this image. It's just two kids fighting. That's fun, right? And I, I don't know what, I mean, this kid, it reminds me of that scene from uh, A Christmas Story. By the way, I hate Christmas movies. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, my wife makes me watch that every year. And it makes me want to call Comcast and cancel our cable. Because uh, I, I, I hate Christmas movies. The only good Christmas movie ever, uh, there might have been two. One of the good ones was Mickey Mouse Christmas Carol. It's the only Charles Dickens work I can tolerate as a Christmas Carol. Um, and I just like the big scary guy at the end that scares Ebenezer Scrooge into the grave. Uh, Pete, I believe is his name, right? The cigar smoking dog. I don't know if he's a dog. Uh, I think he's pretty excited. You don't like Home Alone? No, I saw that movie. That was pretty funny. When I was like seven, I was like, man, I can hit Joe Pesci in the face with a paint can? There are so much better, I would like to say there are better Macaulay Culkin movies that aren't, uh, but there are better Joe Pesci movies. Goodfellas, for example. Casino. I'll think of some more in a minute. Even that movie he was in, with Danny Glover when they went fishing. Gone Fishing was better. And that was a horrible movie for anybody who saw that. Because all I remember is Danny Glover was in it. <coughs> Lethal Weapon? Huh? Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon? There you go. Legit film right there. So, you've got two kids fighting. Um, not a big deal. Hey, look at this. We've got two kids now that are buddies, although this kid still looks pretty angry. I mean, look at that, like, beady eye that kid has. You see that? <laughs> Watch that out. I'm going to get you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but here, and I don't know why they do it with kids, because you really shouldn't. I mean, if at all possible, you shouldn't be, like, dosing kids with psychotropic meds, okay? I mean, that's just kind of like a heads up. I mean, sometimes you have to, so that's fine. But if you can avoid it, do so. Their brains are still doing things, right? And I don't really like screwing around with the things that are still working, unless you really have to. But in this example, this kid's got an SSRI, uh, so there's going to be more serotonin available, so he's going to be happy. Look how happy he is. I don't know. And then this kid, he's like got his hat on backwards now, so you know that's the sign of being happy in kids. Anybody ever wear their hat backwards? I've tried that like eight times in my life, and it never worked. It's like my head is not shaped for that. Like I wear a hat forwards, it's fine. You turn it around and it just, it just looks like I don't even know. It's a problem. Uh, hey, what do we have here? Here's some female rats. Here's the number of fights they have in a 20 minute period. Uh, here's like a placebo and then you give them an estrogen. Not a big deal. Uh, you give them a, a shot of testosterone and look at that massive increase and the number of fights that they're going to uh, initiate between other females, right? So this does tell you testosterone will do the same thing in a female that it does in a male. It'll increase the likelihood of aggression, but it's just um, because females don't have typically uh, high levels of testosterone, you don't see that they're aggressive very often. And this is, you know, you can look at violent crime rates. Males are much more likely to commit violent crimes than females. And that's a pretty standard story. It's been pretty steady that way over, over decades. How many of you have seen a diagram like this before? Yeah, like just last week I showed you something very similar to this, right? It was related to like male and female sexual behavior, okay? This is related to uh, social aggression. Pretty much the same story. Uh, if, uh, and these are in females, if you give them the placebo at birth and then testosterone as an adult, you get low aggressiveness, you didn't do that. Remember, this is the organizational effect, and this is your activational effect, right, of the hormone. So we didn't get anything organized. If you give them testosterone early, you organize that, and you develop that sort of aggressive neural circuits, right? Later, you still have to activate it. So you have to have the organizational effect of testosterone and that activational effect to get high aggressiveness. Okay? This is sort of the standard story in males, testosterone both times, not the standard story in females. And so that's why you have to artificially create it here. 
Look at that rat uterus. How many of you have seen a rat uterus before? I drew a picture of this last week, not as nice as this one, I know. Uh, but there it is. Similar story, right? We've got the uh, females that are next to males. They either have zero male neighbors, one male neighbor, or two male neighbors. Uh, before we talked about the effect on uh, sexual behavior of that extra testosterone, here we're going to focus on the effects of aggression in the, uh, you know, that extra testosterone. Same story though. And I even told you briefly this story before, but I want to talk about it again because this concept of prenatal androgenization is very, very important. Okay? Female rats that are next to a male rat are more aggressive than female rats that don't have male neighbors. Okay? Why? They had extra testosterone during that activational period. So guess what? Their brain circuits were organized in a way that would cause aggressive behavior in the future. Does that work? It's a pretty straightforward story. Is this true in humans? Yeah, I mean, from what we can tell, it's hard to do this in humans. A lot of people won't let you just like cram another baby in their uterus. Uh, Alex, don't make that face. <laughs> yeah, this really like like odd look on your face. Like, how would you even make that happen? You can't. Trust me. Uh, occasionally, you do get two babies in your uterus. That's when you call it twins, right? But again, sometimes they're they're both going to be males. They're both going to be females. They're not always going to be a male or and a female. When you do, uh, though, it does seem like those females are a bit more aggressive on average than, uh, than other females. Also, we talked about uh, CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, right? So we said that was in females uh, you're, who are born with their adrenal glands kind of hyperactive all the time, right? So they have higher levels of those adrenal hormones. Uh, those individuals tend to be more aggressive as adults as well. From what we can tell in humans, uh, not as clear cut of a difference as what we see in rats, because Olivia, we can control so much with rats, right? It's really hard to control uh, all of those sort of environmental factors and so forth in humans. And we've got more complicated brains than rats, despite the fact some of you choose not to use those extra complicated parts of your brain. Questions about that? This, I'm guessing, um, and, I, and, I, and I need to talk to who's gonna make your exam for the final. I'm guessing there's going to be like an essay question or an extended number of questions about prenatal androgenization. I'm going to talk to that guy later just to confirm that for you. So I would really pay attention to this just on the, on the off chance I'm right about that. Alex, I'm making that exam. I know I'm going to ask you about this. Because we've already talked about it in two different chapters, right? So I should tell you it's pretty important. Now are there any questions? I tried to make it a very simple, straightforward story for you. I think I was fairly successful at that, right? If you are a female and you have more testosterone than the average female uh, during development, you're going to have behaviors that are closer to male behavior, typical behaviors, than the average female would have. That's pretty much the story, right? Those behaviors are related to the sexual behaviors and they're related to aggressive behaviors. It's extremely true if you're a rodent. Seems to be fairly true from what evidence we have if you're a human. Again, we're talking about like like small differences, right? But we're not talking about massive differences here. It's not a you know massive increase that you know if you happen to share a uterus with your twin brother and you're you're a female that you're going to go out and just like punch people all day long, <laughs> right? That's not the case, right? and this is a slight increase in the likelihood that you're going to be more aggressive. All right, questions about that? Well, in, you, in humans, we a bit more like genetic instead of like actual, because this is more like, I would, I would not say like environment, or like environmental, but like they're getting the testosterone from the male that are this size them, right? So like human would be just like genetic, like this or I mean, genetic like female have more testosterone than others. You know, I, I don't really know um, it's interesting. I don't know that people have really looked at that a whole lot, uh, to see, you know, different testosterone expression 
uh, in females and how that correlates with behavior. I think that would be really interesting. I imagine someone's looked at it. Uh, I imagine that, you know, however you are exposed to more testosterone, um, whether and whether you're a male or a female, I think, you're going to be more aggressive. The more testosterone you, you have um, at any point in your life, the more aggressive you're going to be um, at that point. If it happens early on and it is some genetic issue or it is one of these um, sort of intrauterine environment mm -hmm. situations, that's going to have a longer lasting impact because it's actually going to drive brain development. Right. Uh, if someone who is exposed as a female to the normal amount of testosterone is, um, you know, as we saw here, given a testosterone shot as an adult, it's not really going to have a major effect because they don't have that that groundwork in place. Right. You really need it. You really need it early on, while you're developing, in order to to set up the uh, those neural circuits that are going to have that extra aggressive. Behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, look at that word. Anybody ever heard me say that before? I put it right there on that slide for you because it's important. <clears throat> I know. Like some of you are like, why is he talking about this so much? And then there are some of you who are like, why is he talking about this so much? Um, and it's that second group of you I'm trying to reach. The first group of you who already have it, Robin, that's fine. You understand it. There's that other group of slackers who might be sitting next to you, uh, who have not caught on when I say something more than once it's important. They may not be sitting next to you. I don't know. Uh, again, prenatal androgenization, it, it increases aggressive behavior in every single species that's ever been studied. Okay? Well, every single species. This is sort of an interesting study about monkeys and drinking. I don't know if anybody's interested in drinking monkeys. No? I'm going to tell you anyway. Eric, it's kind of a cool story. Uh, this is a really sort of complicated idea because there are like four things going on in this, in this uh, diagram. One of them is uh, we're dealing with monkeys. And monkeys have a hierarchy. So there are what we call dominant monkeys, and then there are subordinate monkeys. Okay. So we're thinking about this, right? So we have these monkeys that are dominant in their, their colonies, and then we have monkeys that are supportive. Then we have this sort of mating season versus non-mating season, right? Monkeys tend to mate at certain times of the year. Often this can be related to the availability of extra nutrients or you know, certain things in their environment, right? Within each of these, you see now we're just, it's getting more complicated. We actually have a group of control monkeys and then we have a group of monkeys that um, have been given alcohol. Okay. I, I know, right, 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 like who thought of this study? Who thought, oh man, you know what I'd really like to know? If dominant drunk monkeys are more aggressive during mating or non-mating season than sober subordinate monkeys. I don't, I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like that's like an odd question to ask. But here you go. Here's what happened. Now if you look at this, Dominant monkeys are always more aggressive than subordinate monkeys. That's pretty easy to see, right? Okay. That makes some sense. How do you think they got to be a dominant monkey? They were more aggressive than the subordinate monkeys, and they like beat them up, and then the subordinate monkeys were like, man, that guy's, I don't know, got a great left haymaker, and there's no way I'm gonna try to fight that monkey again. I, I don't know, Travis, what kind of moves they use. I, I'm imagining that it, they, they use boxing. <coughs> They're just going to be out there in their boxing trunks and gloves. And that's going to be exciting. So, the subordinate monkeys are like, I don't think so. Not surprising. You know, that's the same with humans if you think about crime rates and everything. About violent crimes and alcohol use. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, if you look at this, the second thing to pull away from this, after the dominant subordinate thing, you're right, Eric. Is look at the look at the monkeys who uh, were drinking alcohol versus the control monkeys, and what you see is a massive increase in aggressive behavior, and you even see an increase not in the mating season on subordinate monkeys. You see a little bit, but you even see an increase um, in subordinate monkeys when they're on alcohol as well. So yeah, alcohol tends to increase aggressive behavior. 
Uh, what's really interesting is that you see um, why is it important for mating season? You might imagine during mating season you have more, uh, what's that uh, hormone we've talked about a lot that's involved in aggression? Yeah, testosterone, right? You might have more testosterone during mating season, right? And look at that massive increase in aggressive behavior in those dominant monkeys uh, during mating season if they're drinking alcohol. So there you go. So if you want to stop committing crimes, stay off the alcohol and the testosterone. No, seriously, sober women don't commit a lot of crimes, a lot of violent crimes. Uh, drunk men do, right? And, and I, I think the data shows that, uh, shows it pretty clearly. So there you go. If you remain a, a sober woman, you're not going to probably commit a violent crime. If you're a drunk man, though, there you go. Watch out. Questions about that? No, nobody. Anybody shocked by that story? Not surprisingly, right? Hey, who loves impulse control? Great. Because we're going to talk about it. How many of you have ever known someone who's committed impulsive violence? Or you've seen it on TV. You read it in the book, right? Impulsive violence happens. Um, and it's a consequence of this sort of faulty emotion regulation, right? We have all been in a situation where um, something has happened that may have caused us to become upset. That's reasonable, right? Okay, that's, that's expected. Most of us, hopefully, have not responded to that in a violent way, right? You may have had that urge. Remember we said the urges, we'll think about that, but we don't always go out and do that violent behavior, <clears throat> okay? Someone cuts in line, uh, at Starbucks and you may want to kick them, but you don't, right? You control that urge. It's there, you're, and then it's gone. You're okay, it's like, ah, prefrontal cortex, thank you so much. Because I think if you kick someone at Starbucks, they'll kick you out forever. That's what I've heard. I don't know that. I think I've been in Starbucks once, and only the one here on campus. I've not been in another one. And I got lost, that's how I got in there. How many of you go to Starbucks all the time? Great. I appreciate that. I don't know why. I own stock in Dunkin' Donuts coffee, so I hope you drink that instead. That was a joke. They don't pay me enough to own stock in anything. I, I can't even spell stock with all the letters. I've got to leave the K off. Abby thought that was funny. I appreciate it. So, uh, consequence of faulty emotion regulation, again, is that ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? Controlling that impulse control, okay? Keeping your amygdala from running wild. Your amygdala will do that, so you gotta watch out. If you're some guy who doesn't have a prefrontal cortex, and these are some drawings of Phineas Gage, uh, and these are, you know, what, what, what you would uh, see, I mean, obviously this is, he did not die from this and the rod came all the way out, but this is the tamping rod. It's so so long they had to cut it into two pieces here to put it on this page for you, right? So, so there you go, this is the tamping rod. Um, here's where it went up through his head. For those of you that have studied human anatomy, you know you're supposed to have one big hole, right? That's for your spinal cord to go out. Celine, you're not supposed to have two big holes, okay? Uh, that second big hole was an accident, and that's where this rod came straight up through the bottom and then landed about 30 feet away from this guy. You can imagine how good do you think Phineas Gage's impulse control was after this. It was not very good at all. Okay. Hey, there you go. There's that snake I promised you. Watch out. We did release one in the classroom, so it's crawling around. I would love to do that, like in the middle of class, just to see what would happen. Like all of a sudden drop snakes from the ceiling. I don't know why anybody else doesn't think that's fun. Give them a little parachute so they don't land too roughly. <laughs> nobody, nobody thinks that's terribly funny. Hey, so uh, here's a, 
in the like file this one in the interesting fMRI studies. We already had that really interesting fMRI study last week. Uh, for those of you that remember that, uh, and you don't have to raise your hands, it's fine. This is sort of interesting. So here's an fMRI machine. We're going to stick you in there, and we've got this conveyor belt. And guess what we're going to put on this conveyor belt? Either a snake or a toy bear. How many of you are afraid of toy bears? Don't answer that because that will make you look weird. Um, let's assume no one is, right? Toy, toy bears. But being afraid of a snake is sort of a reasonable thing to do for some people. It uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. How many of you have spent your whole lives in West Virginia? Nobody wants to admit to that. That's okay. Yeah, okay. I was like, like no one wanted to admit to that at all. Everybody was like, mm, don't think so. Uh, so let's say, how many of you spent your whole life in North America? That's a, that's a safer answer, right? You guys aren't ashamed of that. So if you've spent your whole life in North America, there's really not a reason you should be afraid of snakes. Uh, we have a handful of snakes that can kill you in North America, a handful, and you're not going to really run across them, okay? And, and the odds are that if one did try to bite you, uh, you could probably make it to the hospital and you'd be okay, right? They're not, I'm not saying like go out and stick your like, hand in a rattlesnake's mouth. I'm not saying that's a good idea. Okay? Uh, but I'm saying, like, you know, they're not as dangerous in North America as they are in some other places. Those of you who have ever lived on, there are two other continents, sort of, uh, well, there's sort of a third continent there. But sort of the two uh, worst continents are going to be uh, South America and Africa. Australia. Yeah, Australia's pretty rough, too. Uh, You've got to watch that one. But if you've ever spent some time in, in those places, then like maybe being afraid of a snake's okay, right, Eric? Because those things can kill you, right? Uh, nobody's got to worry about like a green snake getting you, right? And people get freaked out about that. Now, uh, our species, though, we, we really spent a lot of time uh, as a species millennia ago uh, evolving on continents that had snakes that could really kill us. So maybe being afraid of a snake is actually sort of this uh, important thing, right, for some folks. And it seems like a lot of primates are actually afraid of snakes, uh, not just humans, right? So like monkeys, you can do the same study with monkeys and you'll get the same response. Now, how many of you are like super tough? Well, I, I can tell because you're giving me this look. That's me. Uh, that's, that's the uh, you think you're super tough look. So it's possible, possible, that we could put you in this conveyor belt or in this fMRI, start that conveyor belt with that snake coming closer and closer and closer to you, right? Closer and closer. And, and there is a barrier that's going to keep it from eating you. So just be afraid of that. Be aware of that. Uh, what you would notice in most people is as they brought that snake, and they're, you're in control. You're in control of how close the snake gets to you, okay? As the snake gets closer and closer and closer to you, guess which part of your brain gets more and more active? Well, there are two parts, right? Obviously, you're going to say, well, like the amygdala, right? Because I'm going to be afraid of this. Uh, but you're not getting up and running and screaming. So you are controlling your impulses. So guess which other brain regions getting really excited right now? It's that ventral medial prefrontal cortex, right? Telling you, look. So really, if you want to measure, like, like we now have a neurological measure of courage. And that's ventral medial prefrontal cortex activation. That's pretty cool, right? Who's excited about that? Who's still having trouble breathing seeing the snake picture? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. People get so worked up about that, right? Yeah, well. So that's kind of fun. I don't, I don't know. I thought it was exciting. If you put the bear on here, the, the toy bear, uh, you don't see that increase in activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Right? Why would you, right? I mean, nobody's really afraid of a toy bear. Unless your older brother tried to suffocate you with one. When you were a kid, Matt, then you might have some like lingering response to that. Not a big deal. All right. Um, we've already talked about brain development and the role of the amygdala, so that's pretty awesome. Okay. We've talked about the role of the prefrontal cortex. We said that matures later, where the amygdala matures early, right? So that's why early on kids have these like weird and violent emotional responses, but as you get older, uh, you start to to do a little better with that. Eric, you brought up the whole crime story, right? Um, and uh, issues with brain development there. We've talked serotonin, about how serotonin reduces your uh, aggressiveness. This is sort of interesting. 
This is the uh, relationship between your, uh, the development of your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. As you see early on, your amygdala development didn't end up being a very good arrow. Uh, sort of outpaces your prefrontal cortex development. Starts to catch up a little bit uh, in your adolescent years, and then definitely, hopefully, by the time you're an adult, uh, they've sort of uh, at least caught up, you know, to where they're both equally developed, and then your your prefrontal cortex is going to have some control over that impulse and over those behaviors. How many of you have seen that show, The Good Place? Anybody watch that show? Yeah. So, I don't know. I saw the episode in season two with the trolley. Did you see that episode? I don't remember that one specifically. But. So there's there's some guy in this show. He's an ethicist, and they keep putting him through this trolley problem to see how he would respond to it. And I, I heard an interview with the actor, and they, they shot him with something called a blood cannon. Um, so they took like. Uh, Caro syrup and colored it red and then put bits of foam in there, like literally shot it out of a cannon into his face to make it look like people were exploding and he was getting covered with blood. Um, I don't know, that's, that's not like a terribly great story, but hang in there, it's gonna get better. How many of you have ever had to make a moral decision? Like, if I push that guy off the bridge or I just keep walking? I was like, man, he's pretty close to the edge, I could do it. You guys ever had those thoughts? Uh, we've got you flagged, just letting you know. Uh, I, I think having those thoughts are okay as long as you don't do anything with them, right? As long as you don't actually push someone off a bridge, I think you're okay. Uh, because I think we've all probably thought about it. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, oh, I really could do this? Uh, like physically, I have that capability, but probably I should. I don't know. I think about it more of a thought experiment than like an actual, like I'm going to push someone off a bridge. Um, Largely, I don't go across a lot of bridges, like walking, where I went, because I'm not going to stop my car, you know, to push someone off a bridge. That's a lot of work, and I'm probably in a hurry. So there you go. So you're safe. As long as I'm busy and I don't have extra time, I'm not going to push off the bridge. The point of this is um, we're going to make these moral decisions, right? And they're going to involve personal risk and reward. And we're going to have to figure out how to balance that and think about that. It is going to involve the prefrontal cortex. Okay. What's interesting about this is uh, here's sort of the, uh, the trolley uh, problem, right? And so the trolley problem is, is sort of this sort of philosophical uh, framework where you ask someone in, in scenario A here a very simple question. There's a trolley, train, in case you guys don't know what a trolley is. Why they picked a trolley, I don't know. Trains are much more menacing. Uh, maybe that's why. Trolleys are kind of the neutral version of the train. So you've got this trolley coming down, and they're gonna, it's going to come to a spot where the track splits. And you've got a lever here, and you can control which way that trolley goes. The trolley can go down this path and kill five people, or it can go down this path and kill one person. What do you do? Walk the one guy. You're going to kill the one guy. Nobody's going to say it, but thank you. You're going to kill the one guy because it's one versus five. That's easy, right? Are you going to kill five people or are you going to kill one person? Depends. Do you know that one person? No, you don't know any of them. Oh, okay. We're not getting that. Huh? He's, done. He's done. You don't know any of these people. You don't know any of the six people involved in this. Okay? So there you go. You pull the, pull the switch and you're done. Now, these, these things get more complicated if, like, this one person is, like, someone you like. If it's someone you don't like, it's still the same answer. Speed up. <laughs> Speed up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, like, maybe these five, whatever. These are five, five six people you don't know. Okay? Now, your ventral medial prefrontal cortex obviously gets a little activated. You, think about you got your amygdala, and you've got things going on, your brain's working on this problem, you're going to solve it. Now, in scenario B is a different scenario. We still have a train or a trolley. Find that trolley. 
We still have six people that you don't know. Now, there's not a split. The only way to stop this trolley is to push this guy off the bridge. So you thought I was just talking about pushing people off a bridge for fun. There's a point to the story. Now, if you push this guy off the bridge, he'll stop the trolley and these five people live. If you don't push the guy off the bridge, then these five people die. But running over one person stops the top trolley anyway. <laughs> Jared, I did not create this. This is not my scenario. You're absolutely right. Like, like you could just let the one get right because like then only one person's gonna die. Yeah, but, but even in the first one, it wouldn't matter because only one would die. I understand that. But let's imagine that's not how the, it's a magic trolley, and that's not how it works. Okay? Just imagine that. Uh, see, they put this guy in different clothing so that you know he can actually stop a trolley. I, I don't know. Now, this becomes a different situation because you've actually got to actively push this guy into the path of the trolley, right? And so, so philosophically, it becomes a slightly different question. And that's all fine and good, and, and I think philosophers have their value, um, I guess. Can I say that? I, I don't know. Uh, anybody a philosophy major? Anybody taken a philosophy class? Yeah, how'd that go for you? I always make fun of philosophers because I, I think they just sit around and think, and then they take a nap, and then they get up and eat a ham sandwich, and then they decide whether or not it should have been peanut butter because they don't know if they want to eat meat, uh, and and then they have a philosophical debate about white versus wheat bread, um, and then they they go back to taking a nap. And I think that's the day in the life of every philosopher. Uh, so. It becomes a different question philosophically, and that's important or not important, and you can cite it. But it actually becomes a different question neurologically, because in that second scenario, guess what happens? Your ventral medial prefrontal cortex gets a little bit more active, right? It gets more ramped up in this situation, because it is different, right? It is a different situation. You actually have to push someone into the way, right? And so you actually have to be involved in that activity. Now, if we were all to use the same logic we used in scenario one, Eric, and we decided the dude's a goner, we would say this dude's a goner, right? Very straightforward. One versus five. How many people are you going to kill? You're going to kill one. Can you That's, just, can you just no, you can't. Hero and just jump in front of the train you, yourself? Of pushing someone? Well, that's ridiculous. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're trying to find ways out of it. You didn't think about it the first time. Yeah, but that means you wouldn't have to kill anybody except for yourself. Like. Yeah, but imagine you're better than these people. <laughs> five people you don't know that are, they, let's imagine they, um, they have very nondescript jobs and their death is not going to influence the outcome of the world. You're going to let all five of them go? Overpopulated. Overpopulated. That's actually a fair answer. Um, so there you go. Uh, the, the, the point is your, your prefrontal cortex gets more active in situation B because you're actually personally involved in like pushing this guy off. Hey, if you do, if you push him really far, he can land down here and you can get all six of them. <laughs> it's worth a shot. Back the trolley up and try again. <laughs> what are those four bumps? <laughs> there you go. Uh, the point is, prefrontal cortex activity, right? Here's an interesting one, too. Um, how many of you love brownies? Like everybody, right? That, like, like who doesn't? Every, even people who are like, I'm allergic to chocolate, they love brownies anyway, and that's why they lament the fact that they're allergic to chocolate, right? If you're going to eat brownies, just eat brownies. So I want to spelling up there on that second scenario. Where did the first sentence, the second scenario? Oh, yeah, yeah. I like that. So I didn't make these slides. These are from the <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. That's why I leave it up there to see who catches it and what that says about people. Uh, you never know what people are going to do when they're out on vacation. Um, yeah, anything goes, right? If you're on a speedboat, you're in international waters. Uh, 
guess the, I don't know, whatever. So I would, if you like, didn't get the joke, I would recommend going home and looking that up, not on the university's uh, uh, system, right? Because weird things happen. Uh, I trust. Them. So here's the deal. Uh, you've got three scenarios here. You've got a non-moral scenario. You make some brownies. Not a big deal. Uh, it says like, hey, you should put some walnuts in here. For whatever reason, you don't like walnuts. I don't know who doesn't like walnuts. It's already a weirdo. Uh, and so you're like, hey, I'll just swap it for macadamia nuts, right? Um, so what do you do? You substitute macadamia nuts, if you like those, more than walnuts, to avoid eating walnuts, right? That's, that's like a non-moral, there's, there's no moral judgment involved there. It's like walnuts versus macadamia nuts, eh, who cares, right? Now you've got this situation where you're on the speedboat, okay? What do you do on the speedboat? Well, <laughs> you want to do on the speedboat, I guess. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. All the same. Uh, you've got some folks that are out there on this sailboat, uh, but you realize there's like a storm, you're going to go try to intercept them. Uh, you realize the speedboat, though, belongs to this miserly tycoon, and he's not going to be too happy if you take his boat. Uh, so what do you do? That's the only way to save the people uh, on the sailboat. Do you take the, you take the boat or not, right? I think most people would say, like, yeah. I, I, I mean, so this, like, rich old guy is going to be mad at you, but you've saved these people on a boat, right? And it's not a big deal. If they're going into the ocean, wouldn't they have a radio anyway? Their batteries ran out. These, these are ill-prepared people because they didn't even check the weather forecast here. I think you think the tycoon would have other reasons. Yeah, it probably would. <laughs> <laughs> um, people can sue you. That's okay, though. Right? I mean, but like, like who's going to sue you because you saved me? You're not going to win it. The third scenario here is, is a different scenario where you're on a ship and Eric, you also notice here they misspoke crews. Uh, and there's a fire on board this ship. And then you've got to decide, um, are you going to throw somebody overboard in order to save the lives of the remaining passengers? Because the, the lifeboat's going to, you know, sink. So that is very much sort of this breakdown of these situations. And again, what we see is in this case, more prefrontal cortex involvement than in the other cases, right? And so your prefrontal cortex is going to be definitely involved in uh, moral judgments. So there you go. I think Jack in the door sat himself on the side. Huh? So it was like that Titanic thing, like just put the person on the side of the boat, they're blind, they'll float, save all the time. Yeah, it seems like the plan. Worked out for those guys. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to vote for that guy because he made the decision to throw the guy out, right? I was like, I don't have to. Everybody, every group needs a hatchet man. Um, and if somebody else is willing to do it, magic. So we've thought about some things. Um, but what good are emotions if you aren't able to effectively let other people know what's going on, right? So I think one of the big values of emotion is that communication of emotion. We do most of this through facial expressions. Okay. How many of you have ever made a facial expression? Yeah, it, it happens. It happens automatically sometimes, you don't even realize it. Facial expressions of your emotions appear to be innate. And there are actually a couple studies that show this. One are these cross-cultural studies. So if you go visit other cultures and you say to that individual, uh, hey, make a face like you just, uh, I don't know, something good happened to you. They're going to they're gonna smile. Uh, you know, if you go um, make a face, I know this is like really getting there, like your kid died. Or make a face like you're angry and you're about to fight somebody. And then I love this one. Uh, I call this the dead pig face because this is the face you make if you see a dead pig on the side of the road that's been rotting for a while. Right? And I think these are all, these are the faces you would make, right? Travis, if, if I said, hey, here's $10, you're going to make this first face, right? Like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. And if I said, hey, Travis, here's a dead pig, you're going to, I mean, you may make this face, actually, uh, like the face like you're going to fight somebody. But you're also going to make that, what I call the dead pig face. And the dead pig face is a very important face when we talk about disgust here in a few moments. Because disgust is awesome. You should all be disgusted of all kinds of things. It's what keeps you alive. I promise. 
there are also studies uh, for uh, blind children. Uh, and it's important that, that they've been blind from birth, right? And so if you uh, observe that, uh, an individual who's been blind from birth, you will notice that when they're happy, guess what they do? They smile. Uh, when they're mad, guess what they do? They make angry faces, right? And they've not received any visual feedback from someone else, Eloise, that they should do that, right? They just do it automatically. It's an innate process, okay? So you just do it, do it without thinking about it. Don't worry about that too much. This is kind of interesting, though. How many of you remember the time we talked about blindsight? And we talked about those individuals when you could put trash cans in front of blind people, right? And if it was because they had damage to their primary visual cortex, they could dodge the trash can or the box or whatever you place in front of them, right? Okay. You can take those same individuals that have damage to their visual cortex, and you can actually show them pictures of faces. And you can ask them, what, what face do you see? What, what emotion is being conveyed by this image? Uh, and they will tell you, I, I don't see anything. And then you will say, well, well just, just take a guess. Take a guess anyway. Uh, and far more often than just random chance, they will guess the correct face. If you show them a face that's smiling, they'll say, uh, it's somebody smiling. If it's somebody frowning, they'll say, hey, it's somebody frowning. The other thing they will do, how many of you have ever had someone smile at you? It's a sad group, but that's not happening. Uh, and so how did you respond to that? You smiled in return, right? I mean, that's just sort of the standard response. If somebody smiles, you smile. So if you see a picture of someone smiling, you're going to smile, right? So makes everybody smile. Uh, no, don't, don't walk around like that. Uh, but if you smile, then someone else will smile. These same individuals who say, I can't see that face, if you show them a picture of a, a face that's smiling, guess what? They'll actually start to smile a little bit. And you can, these images, uh, or these graphs here show you the, uh, contraction of their muscles for their like smile or um, sort of frown uh, muscles. And so if you show them a frowny face, they'll kind of frown as well, even though they'll tell you, I don't see anything. So it's pretty cool, right? So we've talked, that's called effective blind sight. That's kind of cool. There's also some laterality to emotion. Let's see if we have, uh, don't have so what's kind of cool, what I mean by laterality, is the right side of your brain is actually a bit more involved in the expression of emotion. And if you um, were to take an image of someone's face while they were smiling, and you were to cut that image in half, and then duplicate the left side and the right side, and so have an image that's two left sides and an image that's two right sides, what you would notice is the two images that are left sides, because remember your control of muscles crosses, the left side is actually going to be more expressive than the right side. And you can practice this at home. You can check it. So go home, and what I, what I would like for you to do is get in front of your bathroom mirror and do this. And then see which side smiles more than the other. So give it a try. Uh, you'll, you'll probably find that the left side is a bit more expressive than the other side. Your, your corners of your mouth may go up a bit more, the corners of your eyes may come so, uh, speaking of Joe Pesci, because you know, we just did that, um, he's been in a lot of movies with a guy named Robert De Niro, who's a method actor, so we should talk about method acting a little bit. Um, how many of you have ever tried to fake a smile? Yeah, it doesn't work, does it? Um, just don't try it, I'll know. No. Uh, so, how many of you have ever had someone fake a smile at you? Right? What's that about? Um, What's interesting when you do a real smile is your, uh, the, like the corners of your eyelid kind of come down a little bit. Uh, and that, that only happens when it's an emotional smile, right? So there are different circuits that control emotional facial expressions and in, in, like uh, voluntary facial expressions, right? We can all fake a smile. Like I said, you know, and that's why, you know, how many of you have ever smiled for a picture, you know, a school picture and it looked like this? <laughs> so they're awful, right? And you're like, I'm not even in the mood for this today. Uh, and it, but, you know, maybe you've got a really good, you know, photographer and they're like telling you a joke and you're like, I'm actually going to smile at that. So it was kind of funny. Uh, and then you get a much better picture that way. Right? So it's really, 
this is why method acting is a, a pretty good approach because it's really difficult to fake a facial expression, right? Because that emotional facial expression has a couple cues, uh, whatever it is, whether it's frowning or smiling or anger or whatever, that trying to fake that on your own just doesn't really work, right? And so if you want to be a good actor, so Michaela, I'm gonna tell you the secret to this, is to really put yourself in that situation, right? If you're trying to play a scene where you're happy, imagine someone just gave you a nice birthday gift, and then you're gonna, gonna be able to pull that off. Uh, if you're you know, trying to pull off a scene where you're angry, imagine someone just gave you like a fruit of the month for your birthday or something. I'm just gonna be really angry about that. Nobody loves fruit of the month clubs. They still have those, is that a thing? Anybody, nobody's a member of the fruit of the month club. No? All right, whatever. So there you go. That's some laterality we should talk about. Uh, don't worry too much about this. This is gonna involve some visual stuff we're not gonna get into. Hey, this is interesting. Uh, this is an individual without damage to their amygdala. Typically, when you look at someone's face, you're going to look at their eyes, and you're going to spend a little bit of time looking uh, sort of down, just a little bit, uh, toward their nose and their mouth. And, but if you think about, uh, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul, right? I, I don't know. That's, somebody said that. I think I read it on a Snapple lid once. Uh, your eyes are actually very uh, telling of your emotion, right? So you can actually like cover up the rest of your face, and then you can, you can kind of do different things with your eyes, and it can actually convey messages, right? So, I mean, how many of you have ever just seen like someone's eyes, and you're like, boy, that person's angry? Um, or you just like see their eyes, and like, well, they're in a pretty good mood. So, so eyes work. If you have amygdala damage, this particular individual, you spend a lot of time instead of looking at the eyes, you didn't look at the eyes at all. They look down at the mouth. And the mouth is can sometimes be telling, but what if you're talking to someone, right? If someone's talking to you and they're in a, in a good mood or they're in a bad mood and you're just watching their mouth, it becomes very difficult to tell, right? Because your mouth is constantly making different shapes for the different words that are coming out, okay? But your eyes, on the other hand, right? How many of your parents have ever said, you better get in here now? Uh, and they make, you know, they have the eyes like this, right? You know, they, but what if they were go, you better get in here now, right? And like, ah, maybe, maybe their eyes are actually pretty happy. And they're like, wow, you better get in here now. Your grandma came to visit and she brought cookies. I'm excited about that. I don't know. Anybody like cookies? No, of course not. So there you go. That's an interesting story. Oh, this is important, though. How many of you have ever seen something disgusting? Don't tell me what it is. I know some of you have impulse control problems. Hey, who remembers that dead pig? Yeah, I was like, dead pig face, right? So, things that are disgusting, why are they disgusting? They're disgusting because they will kill you, right? Okay? So think about the most disgusting thing possible, but then back off just a little so you don't bother, because I don't want to have to see anybody clean that up. I mean, it's not going to be me that cleans it up, but if someone's going to go through that. So if you think about things that are disgusting, uh, and there are things that actually can hurt you, we'll talk about that in a minute. It's also important to know the direction of gaze, and this is important not just for disgust, but also anger. Okay? And so you actually have neurons in your brain that are specifically tuned to the direction of gaze of other individuals. Okay? If someone is making this face, it's important to know, Abby, is that directed at you or someone else? Right? If it's directed at you, then you need to like, probably figure out what you did to make that person mad and then either fix it and or run. If they're looking at someone else with that face, you need to probably like, sit back and watch because it's going to get pretty entertaining. Right? Because somebody's about to get it. Okay? Uh, what's really cool about this is it's not just like the way the person, the way their head is focused, it's actually their eyes. Right? Okay, so if you look at this guy's eyes, they're pointing up. And that got pretty excited, same as exciting here. Here the guy's head's up, but he's looking down, right? So it's the direction of eyes, not the direction of your head necessarily. That's important, okay? It's important to know where things are that are either upsetting someone or making them feel disgusted because we may want to avoid that, right? And whether or not that gaze is directed at us, call that will determine our behavior, right? 
to worry too much about this. I want to show you this awesome picture. This was a uh, study, I think it was, yeah, it was the BBC did this survey, and they showed these images to folks, and they said, hey, rate how disgusting this is. Okay? And then people rated the level of disgust. Some of these things are pretty disgusting, right? You can see some of your faces right now, you're doing this. It's, it's the dead pig face. Uh, what's really interesting is when you compare these images side by side, uh, you know, comparing different categories of images is not terribly helpful. But if you look at this particular image, this is really the same image. This is just blue and this is yellow with some red in it. Right? Now why is yellow with red more disgusting? Like a lot more disgusting than just blue. How many of you have ever had a blue fluid come out of your body? It doesn't happen. How, how many of you have ever had a yellow and red fluid come out of your body? Yeah, there are a lot of things that are yellow and red that can come out of your body, right? Okay? You don't have to share what those are. At least, that's a great dead pig face. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, guess what bodily fluids can do to you? They can make you sick, right? Okay. So, um, I'm just going to have dinner after this class because we're getting ready to talk about, like, pus and vomit. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's stuff that's nasty and it can make you sick, right? And it can be colored like, uh, like this image here. There you go. Uh, what about this guy? This guy's kind of interesting, right? Um, you know, this particular image of him, and not terribly disgusting. But over here, this image kind of looks disgusting, right? Why? His, his hair's all matted down, he looks sweaty, his face is all blotchy. Uh, you don't know anything else about this. I mean, this guy could have just could have just, you know, completed a marathon and he looks like that. Or he could have a fever and some disease. And that disease can make you sick. Right? Hey, what about subway? Anybody ever been on a subway? How many of you have been on a trolley? Yeah. Uh, would you rather get on a, on a subway with a bunch of people crammed in it or with no one? Empty. Why? Because these people can give you diseases. Right? That's why I stay behind the podium. Because you people could give me diseases. And I'd rather you just like pass them amongst yourselves. I keep breathing on each other. Uh, here's another bodily fluid example. This one's pretty self-explanatory. That just looks gross. Uh, who loves worms? Yeah, like, no, no. <laughs> that was, I mean, you even, you even had like, 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 like you just, and I'm sure you're, I mean, I'm not, like, like, please, everyone, don't think this is how Eloise actually looks. Uh, this is just me replicating that face and exaggerating. Is that pretty close? I'm just like, ah. I can even see you like taking your head and like pulling it back. Worms are gross, right? It's not the ones, the, the other picture. This one? Yeah, but actually like the other one grossed me out more than This one grossed you out yeah. too? Yeah, I mean I got a 3.6. That's pretty gross. I mean that's even... It's even more gross than Sweaty Joe here. I don't know what his name was. Let's call him Sweaty Joe. Uh, that's a good name. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there you go. Uh, and nobody likes tapeworms. Don't answer if you've ever had a tapeworm. Keep that to yourself. Lots of gross faces out. Lots of dead pig faces. And then there's one of you going, oh, that seems exciting. No, I'm Uh, do, 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 do. We've already talked about uh, voluntary and emotional facial expressions and different <coughs> kinds of uh, uh, paralysis that you can actually get that will prevent you from making uh, voluntary facial expressions. So if somebody tells you a joke and you think it's hilarious and you'll go, wow, man, that was funny. Uh, and you're not going to make a face. But if somebody goes, hey, show me your teeth, you'll go, and you can smile, but you can't smile because of a joke. The other hand, is uh, so that's going to be emotional facial paresis. You can have voluntary facial paresis, where somebody says, "Hey, show me your teeth," and you go, "Can't do it." Uh, but somebody tells you a joke, and you go, "Oh man, that was hilarious!" And just laugh and smile, and all kinds of things. So different brain circuits, right? That's also related to the um, idea we talked about. It's difficult to artificially produce realistic facial expressions of emotions concept to think about. 
We already said the right hemisphere is more important, uh, plays a more significant role in expressing emotions. So if you decide to, to follow any of the advice I've given you today and you go home and like, start smiling in front of your bathroom mirror, you will notice the left side is, is a bit more expressive than the right side. So that's kind of cool. Don't worry about that one. Uh, we should talk about this a little bit just because it's William James and I don't know. Like somebody once called him the father of psychology, so I feel like I'm required to mention something about him once in class. Does seem okay? Any, anybody heard of William James? Anybody heard of Henry James? You know they were brothers? They were known as the James brothers. Uh, not related to Jesse James, who was another James. Rick James. Who, Rick James, yeah, not related to Rick James. Um, P.D. James, not related to, to that person's author, she's a British author. In fact, I'm less confident about that, actually. I'm, I'm fairly confident about Rick James. Um, so there you go. Anyway, they kind of had this idea like, well, you know, emotions, whatever, maybe it's the behaviors that actually um, and the responses are directed, are, are elicited by the situations, and you feel these emotions because of the feedback from those behaviors. So their idea is like the behavior is first and then you feel the emotion, not you sort of feel the emotion and then you have the behavior, right? And there's some bit of evidence that might support this. Uh, you can kind of, um, I don't know, how many people have ever come up to you having a bad day? Just start smiling, you'll be happy. And you go, I'll try it. I just don't know if it's going to work. Uh, but there is some evidence that, that maybe this works. But probably not all the time, probably not even the majority of the time is this, is this important. But it is important that you do know a bit about this, uh, this theory. So you've got your event that produces that emotional reaction. You've got your muscles that make a behavior. And then that goes back into your brain, and that feedback makes you feel the emotion. So the next time, this is what you should do. The next time somebody cuts in front of you at Starbucks, instead of going, I'm pretty angry about that, uh, just smile and see if it makes you happy. I'm not confident that's going to work. Uh, but William James said it would. So trust that guy. Uh, infants, who cares about them? I mean, they imitate things. Stuff like that happens. All right. Let's see. Who has questions about emotions? Anything you think needs a little more explanation? What if you smile more on the right side? Are you broken? Yes. Uh, well, there's actually, there's actually something interesting we should talk about and we haven't, uh, which I would love to have like a whole class on laterality. Uh, so I think about this sometimes, and we're going to talk when we get into uh, human communication, we'll actually talk a little bit about this. Uh, how many of you are left-handed? Left how many of you are really left-handed? You know what I mean? I'm left-handed. Are you sure? I'm only left-handed. You're only left-handed? I'll take your word on it. Uh, and the reason I'm asking is there's actually a thing called the Edinburgh Handedness Scale. Uh, you can look it up online and take it. And it will tell you like how left-handed you are or how right-handed you are. It'll ask you questions like when you use a broom, which hand do you put on top? Uh, when you brush your teeth, which hand do you use? If you're going to uh, use a bow to shoot a boar, which hand do you pull back on the string with? Uh, that that one's probably not on there, uh, but the other ones are actually. And so if you you know you can answer this and ask this question. There is a possibility that some left-handed individuals might have their brains kind of backwards, and then your right side might be a little more. If you're one of those individuals, the odds that that happens to you is rare. The reason I say that is when we get into the human communication chapter, we'll talk about this. Even people who are left-handed predominantly have language on their on their left hemisphere. You would think it would be the opposite if you were left-handed. So, because of that, the emotions are probably still going to be coming more from your right side the expression of that. So, even left-handed individuals are going to be more likely to still have the left side of their face being more expressed. But there may be a few folks. That was a good question. I only ask because I smile more on my right side. I've noticed it in pictures. Really? 
interesting. interesting. Yeah. But I'm right into them. Well, that seems really interesting. Um, Maybe I'm working. That's a possibility. I mean, we can we can leave that as a working hypothesis for now. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Questions. 